Um, Sheikh Hadid is here. So Sheikh Hadid, mashallah, has studied uh, since 1997 with some of the greatest luminaries around the around the Muslim world, including the Grand Mufti of Egypt, uh, Sheikh Ali Juma. He also studied with uh, Sheikh. Um, Tarbishi, who uh, passed away, may Allah have mercy on him, last year, who had the highest uh, Quran transmission in the world. Um, and we're so, so honored to be with him again. And the topic for today is Seasons of the Heart. And it's kind of, um, I, I took that topic from a poem by Khalil Gibran. Has anyone read Khalil Gibran's prophet? Few people. No one else is literate. Um, <laughs> so it's a poem where he says that, I'm sorry, yes, it's my old camp. But um, he said in the poem that when we see seasons manifest in the physical form, like winter, fall, spring, etc., we're patient with them. So when it's winter, we know spring is coming. When it's very hot it's summer, we know autumn is coming. But when those same seasons manifest in our hearts, we're less patient. So when we go through an emo emotional winter, we forget about spring. When we go through an intense moment of summer, we forget about autumn. And so today we're going to take that, that concept from that poem and apply it to spirituality, and how our aqidah, our orienta vertical orientation to God, can help us deal with some of these emotional seasons that we deal with, such as anxiety, sadness, stress, etc. So without further ado, we're honored to have Sheikh with you. So I'm very pleased and honored to be here in Georgetown. It's my first time here. Part of DC, and I thank uh, Sad Omar and Last Gen Management for arranging this, and I thank all of you for coming out on this very cool, blustery night uh, to spend some time together. So, when I had spoken to Sad about some themes or topics for the, uh, the lectures that we've been trying to give, I've been out of the States for a while now, not really lived here for any period of time for over a decade. So I asked him, what, uh, what are people thinking about? What are the issues that people are facing? You know, when I speak in Cairo, I know there's certain issues there that people are facing that uh, some way similar and some way dissimilar to the issues here. And he said that people have some issues with how to make up the world and the adversity that all of us face, not just in uh, the geopolitical realm, but also in our own personal lives. And as Muslims or as people of faith, it's sometimes difficult to reconcile the amount of suffering and adversity that we often encounter and see others going through with faith. And oftentimes we hear people who, who are not of the faith community sort of disparage the whole idea, saying things like, well, if there really was a God, then he wouldn't allow all this suffering. He wouldn't allow all this evil. Why is this happening? Why are people in Syria getting slaughtered in the manner that they are? Why are people starving in Somalia and Yemen and other places? And that has been the refrain for many people who, who reject faith for a long time. And I was looking at the, the circumstances and the issues that they deal with, and they can't reconcile the two because they make certain assumptions. <coughs> So, we find within our tradition, uh, within our sources, in the Quran and the Sunnah, plenty that says about that. And we should find in our own faith and our own demand plenty to be able to deal with that. You might ask the question, well, if that's the case, then why are people having, still having issues? I'm a person of faith, I have demand, I believe in Allah, I believe in the Prophet, so I said that. But I often ask myself, this question, why is this happening to me? Why are these things happening to me continually or one at a time? Or why am I going through this? I'm a good Muslim. You know, I pray, I fast, I don't harm anybody, but nevertheless, I'm having these difficult issues in life. The Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he would ask, on one occasion, he asked one of the companions. His name was Harith al Madik. He said, Kayfa Aspahta ya Harith. How did you wake up? What state did you wake up in, Harith? <coughs> Normally, when we hear that question, you know, some of us would say, you know, how's it going? What's going on? 
sale. It looks good. Uh, I made you know, X amount of money in the stock market yesterday. My insurance rates went up, and you know, I had a good double caramel latte, plenty at Starbucks, things like that. But when the Sahaba would answer the question, this particular Sahabi, this companion, he said, Ya Rasulullah, asbahtu mu'min al haqqa He said, I woke up as a true believer, or a, a person of true faith. He said, haqq, of the real faith, of the true faith. The Prophet ﷺ responded back to him, Yukunda haqqin haqiqa, fama haqiqatu imani. He said, for every truth, there is a reality to it. So what is the reality of your faith, of your iman? How do you know that you're a true believer? Because here he's making a distinction. Like there's iman, and then there's true iman, or real belief. So he responded back. He said, Azufat nafsi an dunya. He said, my soul no longer desires the dunya. Not interested in the dunya anymore. And here dunya means what people buy for, what people compete for to grasp of dunya. You know, power, prestige, status. We're in the power, prestige, status, capital of the world and everything, right? Washington, D.C. But that's what people are grappling after. That's the dunya. So he said, I'm no longer interested in that. I don't want to be in charge of people. I don't want to compel people to do things. I don't want people necessarily to praise me. I'm not interested in any of those things. So that's a sign, it's a mark of true iman, true faith. But he didn't stop there. He then said, And it's as if I see the throne of my Lord. And it's as if I see the people of paradise visiting one another. وَكَأَنِّي أَسْمَعُ أَعْوَىٰ أَهْلِ النَّارِ And as if I hear the sighs and the screams and the woe of the people of hellfire. So then the Prophet ﷺ responded back to him. He said, مُؤْمِنْ نَوَرَ اللَّهُ قَلَّةً This is a believer that Allah has enlightened, given light to his heart. And in one of the narrations, يَا حَارِثَ عَرَفْتَ فَلْزَمْ حَارِثَ you now know, so stick to this. So in the beginning he said, I'm no longer interested in the dunya, azufat nafsi al dunya. And then he said, he's seeing things. Right? Almost seeing things. He didn't say literally, because your kaf, tashbi, means ka'anni, as if I can see the throne of God, as if I can see the people of paradise visiting one another, as if I can see the people, I can hear the people of hellfire screaming in agony. So that's a person who's not just living this life, this worldly, physical life, but he's, he's gone beyond that. Those are things we're all supposed to believe in, right? We're all supposed to believe in the throne, we're supposed to believe in the people of paradise, and Jannah, and Nada, that they're already created, and that they exist. But this particular companion had gotten to a point where he actually, not just is convinced of their existence, he lives them, he sees them. It informs his day. It informs his actions. It's in, it informs his silence, it informs his words, it informs every essence of his being that he now sees these things. That's the Iman that helps one grapple with all of these things we're talking about. Because if you have an issue with the God's decree, if you have an issue with all that goes around you, and you don't quite understand it, it means that you're still engrossed and encumbered by your physical side, by your physical appetites. Because the human being is made up of both, both parts. There's a physical side, you know, the flesh and the bones and the blood and the nerves and all of those things. People in medical school can describe it better. <coughs> and then you have the medakuti or the divine side. And that's the side that ennobles the human being. That's what distinguishes the human being from all other creatures. Right? Physically speaking, we're not the strongest creature. You know, the lion, the tiger, the bear, the shark, elephant, they're all physically stronger than human beings. If you got into altercation with one of those things with no assistance, you would, you would probably lose. But that's not why Allah made us 
is stewards of the earth. They trusted the earth, they trusted the amana, stewardship, to human beings, not, not to any other creature. And the reason for that is because he divinely inspires the human being. And the reason that we're ennobled is our essence, not this, not the physical part. You know, people spend so much time and so much money trying to improve what this looks like. You know, people get, you know, they age and they start to wrinkle, then they inject themselves with Botox and then they do plastic surgery and then they liposuction and all this to improve the physical side of it. But that's not your reality. And no matter what you do, no matter how much you spend on that, one day it's going to matter nothing. You'll be in the grave and you'll be done. And the worms and the uh, parasites and the enzymes and all eat away at your body until there's nothing left. So that's not what's what counts. So if the true essence is your soul, then that's the one that you should be concerned with. Right? When God enabled Adam, alayhi salam, he ennobled him because of that. Not because of the physical aspect of things. So when he said to the angels, Inni fil ardi khalifa, I will put on the earth a steward, a vice chairman, a representative on earth. Before he created our father Adam, before he created anyone, he told the angels this. They were perplexed. They actually questioned God on this issue. They said, how can you, you put someone, this being that is corrupt, and will spill blood? And we are the ones who hymn your praises, and we are the ones who exonerate you and place you above all else. Angels are saying that. Then God said back to them, I know that which is what you do not know. Then he taught Adam all of the names. There's different interpretations of what that means. But all of the names could mean also mean all of the languages, the names of things, knowledge, right? The name of the things that God was going to create that the angels were not familiar with, that they didn't know about. Who was given that knowledge? Adam was given that knowledge. And then he told them to tell the angels to show them the names. They said, we don't know the names. They said, subhanahu. We don't know those names. And we don't know anything except that which you teach us. So the angels understood that. As a further uh, affirmation of this, that God then asked the angels to prostrate before Adam, the next verse. And they did. Except someone who was not of the angels in form, but was of the angels in deed, namely Iblis, Shaitan, Satan. He was amongst the angels. He was a worshiper of God for thousands of years. Before that moment, he was asked to prostrate before Adam. In fact, he was so high in rank that he was placed amongst the angels. And he is not an angel. He is a jinn or a creature created from fire. <coughs> so they all prostrated except him. Why? He said, I am better than him. You created me from fire. And you created this being that you want me to prostrate before from dirt. And in my faulty rationalization, fire is better than dirt. And hence, the first racist. <laughs> because he's looking at the physical form. He's looking at the outside. He's not looking to the true reality and essence. Right? And that's how racists work these days. They look to, you know, what color are you? What ethnic background are you? Where are you coming from? Is that the essence of the person that you're being racist against or discriminated against? Don't they have a similar essence and soul to you? Weren't they endowed with that by God? So on what basis are you discriminating against? But that's what he did. It's a satanic thing. You discriminate, distinguish amongst people because of our form. That includes handicapped people. That includes people who don't have the necessary you know, uh, physical capacities that we might want them to. It's a satanic thought. So, when he refused, and he said, I am better than him, he created me from fire, and he <coughs> created me from dirt. So what, the mistake that Iblis, Shaitan, made La'anahullah, is that he didn't understand the reality of, of Adam. He didn't see the real Adam. The outside is dirt, but the inside is not dirt. In another verse that gives us a, a 
insight into the meanings of these verses, he says also to the angels, إِنِّي خَالِقُ الْبَشَرَ مِنْ ثِينَ I am creating a bashar. In other words, bashar means from a bashar, from skin, like the human aspect, the, the physical form of the human being. مِنْ ثِينَ From dirt or clay. Then the next verse, فَإِذَا نَفَقْتُ فِيهِ مِنْ رُوحِي فَطَعُ لَهُ سَيْدِهِ But if I put into him my divine spirit, Ruhi. If I put into my divine spirit, then you are to prostrate before him. So the reason that they're asked to prostrate, they're not worshipping Adam, is a prostration of uh, fulfilling of God's command, not that they're worshipping him, but God asked them to do that because of that divine aspect. I put into him my divine spirit. That's what makes him important. That's what makes him significant. You know, often you hear these people talk about the human being and the cosmos and the universe, and you say, you know, look how tiny we are, and we're just a little speck. And if you look at the Earth and how big it is, and if, you know, the astronauts when they go out to space and they look and see how insignificant the world is, that means how insignificant is the human being then, as compared to the whole matter of the universe. But what they miss is yes, if you're only looking at the physical aspect of the human being, his size as compared to the size of the universe, or the expanding universe, then he is nothing. But that's not what makes him who he is. What makes him who he is is that divine aspect, the malakuti aspect that Allah has given all people, every single human being, is given a piece of that. And we're all given a piece of that on that day when all the souls were there before they were actually made into existence in this world, and God said to all of us collectively, Am I not your Lord? And everyone said, Bella. Not an exception. Everyone said, Yes, you are our Lord. That uh, instance in, I would say, pre time, pre existence, before we actually came out into our physical forms, we were just essences. We were just soul back then. But we knew to say, Yes, you are our Lord. And when we knew to say that, this is that divine aspect, that fitra, that primordial understanding we have in all of us. You know, many people, when I speak to them, when they ask them, they're asked, how come you came to Islam? What, what is it about it, that Islam? I don't really hear too often, you know, you know, the social aspect, or, you know, I like the way the prayer is, or I want to get married. Some people say that. But the ones who, who really, you know, want to be into Islam, they say, I don't know, I just... It all made sense. I found what I was looking for. You know, it was already in me. I just didn't hear it articulated before. Now it's just right there. What's that? That's their fitrah. That's them remembering the day they said, yes, when God asked them, am I not your Lord? So the human being, the sound human being, always has a longing for the divine. And they understand that all of this is temporal, it's ephemeral, it's transient, it's going away. You know, look at people's fascination these days with the supernatural and the occult. You know, all those, those TV shows that they have now, they're all dealing with vampires and zombies and uh, super, superheroes and people who are doing things that are sort of completely outside the realm of what we normally see happening. And I think the reason for that is because people long for that. People want that. One of the things that the European Enlightenment bequeathed, not only on Europe, but on the United States, um, was that we stopped believing and taking into account things that we can't perceive with our senses, with our physical senses. You know, it's people like David Hume, Florian John Locke, who may or may not be believers, but their, their thinking or, or, you know, eventually led to the idea that of cause and effect, and only the thing that you can empirically <coughs> observe, observe phenomena by one of your five senses, is real, is true. Anything outside of that can't be accepted as knowledge, can't be accepted as truth. And this developed until now we live in a time where, you know, if you talk about God in a public forum, public discourse, and you talk about angels and prophets, and, you know, some people just will smirk and laugh because they think that's completely ridiculous. You're living in a day and age where, you know, you sent a man to the moon and you, you, know, you fly airplanes at supersonic speeds, and what are you talking about? And if you read some of uh, the modern-day atheists or scientists like uh, Richard
Richard Hawkins and others, you know, they think it's a big joke. You know, they think that eventually we'll get to a point when we will understand how everything works. Once we understand how everything works, how the universe works, and we can account, make a, a, a plausible explanation for everything, then we no longer need to believe in God. As if God is a crutch that people stand on because they don't understand the way things work. And this goes back to the concept of mystery. In, in Christian theology, there is always a concept of mystery. God works in mysterious ways, ways you'll never understand. And unfortunately, the church pinned some of its doctrine on some of these phenomena that turned out to be scientifically disproven later on. Like, you know, the, uh, eventually the theory of the heliocentric Earth, and uh, the church had insisted for a while and that the sun revolved around the earth and made it almost church doctrine. When that happened and then the Enlightenment began and the European Renaissance before that, people began to distrust religious teachings and say, well, you know, it doesn't make sense. It defies science. Science is one thing. The church is something else. Religion is something else. Why would I want to believe in that? I mean, people started to reject it. And so we get to a point where you can't really talk about belief in the unseen or belief in angels or anything that you can't perceive with your senses or the origin of the universe, you know, except that they want to label you something. They want to take it outside of the public forum, outside of the public discourse, because it's very uncomfortable, because it doesn't jive with modernity. It doesn't jive with the ways that we think about the world. And eventually we should be able to solve everything. And even if you were to figure out how everything works, or you think how everything works, how does that disprove the existence of God? Right? As Muslims, we don't really say God works in mysterious ways. We don't really have the word mystery. We say there's asra, there are secrets. And the difference between a secret and a mystery is a mystery can never be known. Whereas a secret can be known. So Allah works in certain ways that we may not know, but they are capable of being known. We just don't know. And some people get to know them, and some people don't. Hadith ibn Malik, he got to know some of them. Because when he says, as if I see these things, what he's talking about, he's living them, he's seeing them. He believes they're more real than this, than the skin on your, on your bones. That's how real it was to him. When Sayyidina Ali, he was told, or he said, if the hellfire and paradise were put before me, I would not increase in certainty. He doesn't need to physically see them. Because they're already ingrained in his heart, they're printed. He's living them. He doesn't have to see them. And this is the type of faith, the type of iman that people can get elevated to if they avail themselves of such a thing. So going back to uh, this type of iman, the iman of haq or true iman, in another hadith, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi refers to it as sweetness of iman, halawat iman. When he says, Three people or three types of people, if they are within that, they will find the sweetness of faith, the sweetness of Iman. The first one he mentioned, that Allah and His Prophet are more beloved, Allah and His Messenger are more beloved than anything else, period, than anything else in the world. Himself, His own soul, His parents, His family, His friends. Doesn't matter. More beloved than all of those things. And that he loves for his fellow man, brother, sister, what he loves for himself. And here the word ahihi, brother, it doesn't just mean, obviously, blood brother, it doesn't mean that. It doesn't just mean male, so it could mean also sister. And I would say it doesn't just mean Muslim either. Because someone could be your akh, it could be your brother in humanity. So to prefer for others, right, and that's the real meaning of altruism, right, to prefer others over yourself. That's a sign of having the sweetness of Iman, and our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he said that. And then the last one he said, And that he should return back to a state of disbelief. He would hate spies to turn back to a state of disbelief. In the same manner, he would despise to be cast into how fire. So if you look at those three things, one of the things they have in common is that they don't deal with deeds or actions. He didn't say the person who finds sweetness of faith will be the one who prays, uh, you know, 
to touch with every night, or the one who fasts every Monday and Thursday, or the one who gives charity every Friday. He didn't say anything like that. He made the matters of the heart. And the heart is the receptacle of our true essence. And as they say, it is that which Allah's vision sees is via is looking at our hearts. He doesn't look at our forms or our bodies. He looks at our hearts. So the first one dealt with love, and the second one dealt with love. Right? To love Allah and His Prophet more than anything else. And to love for your fellow human being what you love for yourself. So both have to deal with love. One, as Dr. Omar Khum says, is a vertical relationship. In other words, your relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is built upon love. And your horizontal relationship, that is you with everyone else, is also built upon love. And the last one is similar to love, the opposite of it, to despise something, but to despise something that we should despise, that's despicable. In other words, to be outside of the realm of proximity and closeness to God, one should hate to fall out of that. In other words, falling out of love. That's what kufr is. You're falling out of a state of love. Love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, love of the Prophet, and love of your fellow human beings. That's why many people who, who reject so vigorously, they don't only reject God, they reject everyone else too. They don't like people. Right? And one of the signs of the believers is that you shouldn't dislike people. You shouldn't despise people. You see people, they're manifestations of God's will. They're, they're instruments of the divine will. So why should I be upset with them? Why should I dislike them or despise them? It's not really them that's doing things. Allah is giving you signs via them that they're doing things. And that informs your relationship. So your relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala informs your relationship with everyone else. In other words, you can't claim to have a strong divine relationship and at the same time people can't stand you. Something's wrong. Right? And you hear that a lot. You know, sister, how come you know you're not wearing the hijab or you know, why are you not doing this or why are you not doing that? And sometimes you'll see, you know, to be frank, they'll say, Well, this person wears the hijab and she's terrible. She lies, she cheats, she does all these sorts of things. So it didn't work for her. Must not be that important, so why should I do it? <clears throat> or you hear, you know, or a brother you say, well, how come, you know, you're not praying all the time? Well, you know what, that guy prays five times in the masjid, but I live, I'm his neighbor, and he beats his wife every night. So what, what good did the prayer do for him? So on, okay. And it's actually the, the actions of so-called religious people, people who claim to be religious or appear to be religious, that really what turns people off from religion, I think. And this is a growing phenomenon. I just came from Cairo, Egypt, and it's it's growing exponentially. People are beginning now to reject Islam, and you have to remember that Egypt, Cairo, it's really after the fall of Baghdad uh, in the Abbasid uh, Empire, Cairo, Egypt became really the, the cradle of Islamic learning, the center of the Muslim lands, in terms of learning, in terms of scholarship, faith, a lot of things. Even the, the political supremacy was in Cairo for a long time after that, with the Mamluks and the Anyway, so now we're hearing that people are rejecting faith because, you know, this guy is talking about religion and stuff, and then he he curses, he cheats, he uh, he accuses people of adultery, he does all sorts of crazy things, and people call him sheikhs, right? And I was at I had a public speaking event like a few weeks ago, a few months ago, and um, it was like at a, a women's uh, solidarity type of day or something. In the public place. So I opened up as I usually open, just like I opened right here. When I said Alhamdulillah, Salah, the Prophet, and so forth, I'm looking at people's faces and they're like, like I said something that was completely crazy, like, what are you doing here? We're not, you know, we're not of that group. But then when I started speaking, and I told them, you know, I, I even talked about sexual harassment, which is a big problem in Egypt now, it's reached epidemic portions. And, uh, Afterwards, they were all coming up and said, that was great. You just scared us a little bit when you started off talking like a shit. But then after, you, you know, after that, when you started talking things that made sense, you know, it was great. That's where people are at. You know, they, they're very scared. You see this disconnect. And I think this disconnect is contributing to, you know, the effect on people's faith and how they see events that happen to them. And, you know, they don't see... Good examples in front of them. The 
Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi used to nurture people and take them to places just by looking at them. You know, the nawa. Just have a look. You know, imagine if Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi was here and he's looking at you. He just gave you a look. He acknowledged your existence. It would make all the difference. There was a man who went to Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi and, you know, he approached uh, some of the companions first and he said, uh, you know, I really love fornication. I love zina. You want to talk to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi I love sleeping with the Lord and not my wife. So. They were aghast. What? You want to go talk to him? But they had to let him. So he went. So the man went to the Prophet. He said, the Prophet was going to spoke to him. And he said some things that made a lot of sense. He's like, well, would you like it for your sister? That was your sister or your mother or your brother. Or things like this. And so when he left, he said, the most beloved thing to me before I entered was fornicating. And then the most despicable thing, despised thing after I left was fornicating. Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, you know, um, you know, let the sa'a, you know, when's the hour? I'm kind of worried what's going to happen and things like that. So the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, and he's done this on more than one occasion, he answers the question with the appropriate answer. In other words, the question he should have asked. When is the hour? Nobody knows. Not even the prophet knows. So he said back to him, Ma da'adat What have you prepared for it? That's the appropriate question you should be thinking about. Not when it comes, but will you be ready when it comes? So he said, okay, preparation. I didn't fast too much. La kathir, salatin wa I didn't fast too much. I didn't pray too much, to be honest with you. Walakin. Except I love Allah and His Messenger. And then the Prophet said, What did he say back? Are you kidding yourself? What do you mean love? No, he didn't say that. He said, You will be with the one you love. You will be with the one you love. So it's not about all those other things, it's about love. Love, it's a cliche, but love conquers all. Because if you love something, there's nothing going to stand in your way from doing that thing. Nothing will stand in your way. And we've all experienced that. You really want something? You really love it? doesn't matter the obstacles. You'll traverse thousands of miles. You'll traverse ocean. You'll climb mountains. You'll do it if you love it. But if you're just merely rationally convinced of it, it's kind of burdensome. Right? Like the Quran says about the prayer in the Quran, that it's a burden. Illa al khashim. Prayer is a burden except for those who have presence of heart. They love it. Right? The Prophet said, What did he say to Bilal about the prayer? You know, give us solace. Call the Adan. Let's pray. And even when he described the prayer, right, he said, In the prayer. He didn't say that the light of my heart is, or the light of my eye, is the prayer. No, he said it's in the prayer. In other words, the prayer itself is a means, it's not the ends. It's a means. The ends is that hudur. It's God, consciousness, and presence. It's seeing the reality and tasting it. Really seeing it. And not to be confounded and bewildered by the kathra. Right? Not to be confounded and bewildered by all of these, the multitudes. Like the Quran said, al hakum al al-maqab. You have been distracted by the takathal, by the multitudes. You see so many things, so many people, so many things confound you. Like, wow, what's all that? But in Muwahid, the one who really is experiencing living Tawheed, he only sees one. He sees Allah behind all of that, and before all of that, and enacting all of that, and no one else. Because no one else counts. Right? al kulu this reality is all darkness, except that Allah which is in light. Because if it was not for Allah's light, none of this would come. Allah moves samawat to the Does the Quran say that? Allah is the light of the heavens and the earth. In other words, there is no heavens, there is no earth, there is no nothing without that. And Allah has blessed us in a myriad of ways we, we can't even begin to comprehend. Winter, and if you count a single blessing, not many, many blessings, you can't count them all. So, 
Allah SWT has blessed us in many ways. The two main ways that He has blessed us is by giving us existence to begin with, making us alive. Because He didn't have to do that. Don't think that Allah had to create the world so that people can worship Him. He's not in need of us. Don't be. He doesn't need us in the least. And like the Prophet said, كان الله ولا شيء عليك. There was Allah and nothing else. Nothing. Not time, not space, not the universe, not the sun, not the earth. Nothing. We can't even comprehend it, that nothingness because everything that we know, all of our frames of reference, are based upon time and space. So we can't even comprehend that. We can't think out of that box. That's our box. But Allah gives us little indications about how it really was and how it really is. So can Allah ولا شيء معه. As Imam Ibn says, and he is now as he was before. God is immutable. He can't change. He's exactly the same. We all change. Everything changes every day. Little changes, big changes, doesn't matter. But that change indicates we're approaching an end. And that change also indicates we had a beginning. So as long as you're changing and it's visible to you, know that you had a beginning and know you're going to have an end. So, brought us into existence, and he didn't have to, he didn't have to. There were infinite possibilities. He could have made you completely different, right? You know, you're, you're five nine, you know, you want to be six feet, but you know what? That's not the possibility Allah wanted for you. He made you that height. He wanted to be from this particular place, from this particular country, have these particular parents. But out of all the possibilities that could have been, that's the one that was chosen. God's choice, not yours. Would you not prefer God's choice over your own choice? That's his choice. That's what he will. So he brought us into existence. And the second blessing is he continually keeps us in existence. Ni'mat al dead. So we could go at any moment. Every breath that we're taking could be the last. He continually keeps us existing. Right? We don't think of God as a prime mover. That he is a cause in the back and there's other little causes and kind of the whole thing operation is on autopilot. No. Oh He is closer to you than your car is out of That means that every breath, every instance, from this second to the next, God is actively creating that for you. It's not something on autopilot. That means he can take that away too. But he chooses not to. So you gotta think about that. Why am I still breathing? Why did I wake up today when I could have died in my sleep? Why did I narrowly avert that car accident the other day? These are reasons for you. These are hiccups. These are wisdoms. These are signs that Allah puts, right? There's signs in the book, the Quran. That's one book. And there's a second book that we don't spend enough time thinking about. This, the book of creation. Signs all over the place. Right? The famous poet, he said, And in everything there is a sign. That indicates that he is one, living that tawheed. So it's not about how much we do in terms of prayers and deeds, it's about how our heart is, and how do we go about rectifying our hearts. If that's what this whole sweetness of the man is talking about, and if that's what's going to help me deal with all of these circumstances around me, really understand them and accept them. Because acceptance or acquiescing to your circumstances is one of the Highest forms, if not the highest form of faith. It's the most difficult, one of the most difficult. And it's coupled with mahabba. Imam al Ghazali talks about this. And he refers both to rida, in other words, being content with your circumstances, and mahabba, love, in the same breath. They come right after each other, or are closely associated with another. Because if you have true mahabba, if you have true love, then you'll be content with whatever the beloved throws your way. Right? Just think about in your life that girl or that guy or that whoever that you really like or that you really love. They can do no wrong in your eyes, right? At least initially. <laughs> <laughs> Except my wife, she can do no wrong all the time. <laughs> <laughs> That's not so she's going to relay the message. 